right, so first up today are some warm-ups from past AP exams. Number, uh, this would have been number three. Uh, I didn't screenshot the year, but I know the copy problem is since I've been teaching calculus, so it's not like super old. Um, so they were given in this year for their third problem, which would have been no calculator. The first two are calculator, and then you do four without. So we went ahead and calculated for this. Uh, a situation where hot water was dripped into a coffee maker filling a cup. The amount of coffee in the cup at time t is given by the function c. Tells you it's differentiable for a reason. It's probably in another question. But if you know it's differentiable, you know you can take the derivative everywhere. You also know if it's differentiable that it's also what? Remember? Continuous. Yeah, so it's kind of, you must need to reference continuity in another part of the problem. And then it says they have just done like a screenshot of what's happening from zero to six minutes. So we don't know what's happening at like one and a half minutes or whatever. And it says to use the data on the table to approximate this. So go ahead and box that in. It says approximate because three and a half is an on there. Know that that's an approximation for the derivative. The derivative graphically is the slope of the tangent line. The uh, derivative in content is the instantaneous rate of change. So it would be at three and a half minutes exactly how fast in ounces per minute, right? is coffee entering the pot. Got it? But we can't figure it out exactly, which is why it says to approximate it. So we're going to go like this. The, the rate at which coffee is entering the cup, because that's what the derivative is, the rate of change at a given instant, um, is going to be approximated by, do you guys remember we did one of these in the notes? And I told you when it's not on the table, do you remember where I told you guys to go? Right where? Yeah, right on the interval, right next to it. So really graphically what you're doing is you're trying to figure out maybe what happens right here. So you're getting as close as possible to approximate. The farther away you get, you can see that if I chose to use these two points farther away, my secant line isn't a good approximate. So really I'm just going to use some algebra 1 to find the slope of the secant line that's closest. So I call it straddling that point. So one of the points for this problem would be showing what they call a difference quotient. So it will say student showed difference quotient, which is what I'm doing right now. And then and this would be over the course of 4 minus 3. Then I'm going to label it because it says indicate units of measure. So my top was in ounces, so I'd say ounces per what? Minute. It's a rate of change right at that instant. Do you think students were allowed to leave that, based on what I told you? You're nodding, right? Because it's an FRQ, and on FRQs, you do not need to simplify your numbers. So if you accidentally subtracted two from, it's obviously 1.6, correct? But if perhaps maybe you accidentally go negative 1.6, or you do something weird, just go ahead and leave it. Sometimes, though, it'll also add, so this would have just been a two-pointer, one for the different quotient and one for the label, because it asked for the label. If it didn't ask, there's no point for it. Um, sometimes there were three questions, and it'll say indicate units of measure and explain your answer in the context of the problem. But it should have done the same thing. We'll talk about that at another day, because we have a short dollar today. So next up is a multiple choice that comes from this chapter. It looks like my fraction bars didn't quite copy very well. All right, so I want to talk about, first of all, the person, let's suppose it's Miss Josie, and she goes, oh, that's me. Wow, easiest question on the test. What would she have done incorrectly? Made up her own rule that we can take the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. You can't do that, all right? So, and the kid is just like, well, I know I draw a line in square below. Well, if you notice, they kind of insert the case that they didn't know that. So, <laughs> there it is. We actually need to go do our low, our quotient rule, d high, which would be a 2, low d high minus high. My guess is one of these answers comes from a plus, because that's a pretty common mistake. Uh, so, low d high minus high, and then a d low, which would be a 3. I'm going to draw my line, and I'm going to square below. Notice, um, because it's multiple choice, I didn't write like dy, dx equals, or anything like that. I can be fairly uh, quick 
and sloppy, but I need to be accurate. So just be a little bit careful. I have a 2x plus 4. I'm just going to put the 4 on the top of that so I don't, I always rewrite it, save time on multiple choice. And then it looks like I'd have a minus 6x, 6x minus 6x, so that's gone. And then I'd have a minus 9 on the top. All right? So that's going to lead me to D. That one is on your test on Thursday. Would you get it? Yes. yes. How about the first one? Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. there's ones just like those, but not the same. I like this question a lot because you have to understand sort of uh, what a tangent line is. So it says at what point on the graph of y equals 1 half x squared, when I get a graph that I know what it looks like, that's a parent function of a parabola with just a, uh, I don't know what they call it because I don't teach algebra 2 and I actually never have. Do they call it a stretch and compression or do they call it like a stretch? Yeah. Okay, so this would have been a compression of a half. It's going to widen it. Um, and it says at what point on the graph of that parabola is the tangent line parallel? All right. So if my tangent line has to be parallel, let's go put one on there just for the heck of it, to some other line, right? And that's the other line. What's got to be true about them? Again, back to algebra, what's true if a tangent line runs parallel to a random line? Excellent. So I need to find the slope of this line, not calculus, and the slope of this line, calculus. Agreed? So how do I get the slope of my tangent line right here? Derivative. That's what a derivative gives you. So I'm going to go up and I'm going to take the derivative with the power rule. The 2 will kill off the 2, x to the first. My derivative is just x. Agreed? Yeah. All right. So my y prime equals x, and I have to set it equal to the slope of this, this rando line that I'm supposed to run parallel to. So what do I have to do with rando line? I do. I have, well, not point slope. Slope, slope intercept. intercept. I would just do that in your head. I'd be like, okay, I'd have to subtract 2x. This doesn't affect the slope at all, so I don't really care about the y-intercept, right? So the 3 I'm not really uh, thinking of, but I would subtract 2x. Just go like that. It's multiple choice. Save some time. Divide by negative 4, right? What's the slope of rando line? 1 half. Boom. I now know that the x has to be a half. Gone, gone, gone. And actually, if this one wasn't or this one wasn't, I wouldn't even plug it in, right? If 4 are gone, we're at our answer. But unfortunately, now I have to plug it in. So I have to go back to the question. At what point on the graph of? I'm looking for this point. Correct? So, how do I figure out the y coordinate at that point? Plug the half into what? The original for the line or the curve? The Excellent. All right, so I do a half of a half squared, which is a half of a fourth, which is an eighth for b. All right? This chapter is very, I, I like this one a lot more than limits, don't you guys? Is there more to it? The rest. Oh, there we go. Love this question. I put a star by it, all right, uh, just because it's going to pop up on your review on Monday quite a bit. It's like three of them, I think. So piecewise functions we work with a lot. Kind of understand what f of x is. It is a line until we hit 1. Once we hit line, it transitions into a parabola, correct? The question is, we need to find values for a and b. We did this last chapter with a different word right here, right? What were we forcing last chapter? Continuity. So we had to make sure that the line and the curve took off from the same exact point. Agreed? But now it says differentiable. So continuity is not enough because that has a very sharp turn, right? So there's two things you have to make sure. First of all, you still need to be continuous because functions that aren't continuous aren't differentiable. So we're going to go back to last chapter and force them to meet up at this exact same point. So we're going to put a 1 in for x and say 1 plus b, this is old news, has to equal a times 1 squared. I have one equation and two unknowns, which means I need another equation, and I told you they can't meet up right there. Agreed? So the next thing I have to do is make sure that there's no sharp turn. And that's about the derivatives. 
the derivative of this one has to match the derivative of this one. There's a very sharp change in the derivatives right there, right? At a positive slope, it's suddenly switched to a negative, and that's what causes the sharp turn. Are we good? I feel like you guys are in the zone today. So really what I need to make sure is that the derivative now from the left is equal to the derivative now from the right. If it's multiple choice, I just launch into it. But if this was part of an FRQ, I'd have to talk about what the derivative is, and I'd have to write it like this. I need the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of the derivative. So basically what I'm saying is, I need, as I come in from the left, I need the slope of this to match up with. Again, if I'm just talking about if it was part of an FRQ, you can't write e left equal to e right. That's just the root words, but the math that goes with it is right here. All right, so we're going to hop up and take a derivative on the top. What is the derivative of this line everywhere? Meaning its slope, right. So from the left, I've got a 1. I have to make sure that it continues to be a 1 from the right. So what's the slope of or what's the slope of the line at that curve? I need to take the derivative. 2ax. Yep, 2ax is my power rule. And where do I have to make sure that these guys have a very smooth exchange at x equals 1? 1. We plug the boundary into the original and the boundary into the derivative. Does that make sense? Alright, so this makes sure they meet. This makes sure they meet smoothly. So I'm going to go put that 1 in for x. I get 1 equals 2a. So a is a half. I'm going to go put that up there because I'm going to show you this graph on decimals because this problem is actually really good. All right, so my a is a half. So my parabola needs to be the parabola 1 half x squared. Now my line, oh, bless you. All right, I thought you were going to peek on that one. I don't look like, oh, I'm just recording, sir. All right. <laughs> Did you like, hear it at the end? I was like, like, hey, she, uh, all right. Sorry. Who was it? Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> now it's it's on YouTube for all to do. Here, here. What would you call it? A, a, a snoop? Is it snoop? 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 Oh, no, no, no. All right. I'm just thinking of a funny word for like snoop. All right. Anyway. What was I? What was I doing before he so rudely interrupted me? Oh, I am going to go to decimals. After I plug A in right here, so those of you watching, sorry, we had a little... We went off on a tangent. There's a funny joke about that. What did the two calculus students say on the date? I want to be your tangent so I can ride. Oh, wait, that's not me. I want to be your derivative so I can ride tangent to your curve. Oh, wow. Oh, 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 we'll just, we'll just crop this. <laughs> All right. Anyway, sorry. That was actually funny. I didn't even mean to say that. Well, I did. I came right where this is coming out. I'm like, this is going to be funny. <laughs> Alright, so anyway, um, my B. My B is going to be negative. That's what it was actually. It's the pickup line. That's the actual joke. Yeah, it wasn't around the day. It's a pickup line. Alright, you must have heard of it. What? <laughs> no, I've never heard that before. Okay, so my line, I'm going to actually go to decimals right now. My line is x minus a half. And my parabola is one half x squared. And I already entered it on decimals, so you guys don't have to suffer through me trying to enter piecewise functions on decimals because it's it's not that it's hard. I I don't know. Uh, every year I go to do it and I forget, and then I have to Google it, which I did this morning. So I'm gonna blow this up a little bit for you. So you can see the red line. Do you see it? Is that big enough for you guys to see it? The red line I put its boundary on. I said x minus the half we found for x less than or equal to 1. The parabola I didn't chop off yet, and I wanted you to see me do that. That would be for x being greater than 1, correct? Do you see right there that incredibly smooth exchange? Right? Not only do they meet, 
but they meet with the exact same slope. Where the line took off, the parabola took off with the exact same slope and then started to curve. All right, so it's good to see a visual of what you're finding. Otherwise, you're just sort of doing math and don't get quite what you're doing. So we were finding the A and B that make the function differentiable, which meant we forced continuity first and then the slopes to be equal. So the next one up is me at the beginning of the year saying you'll never, or year, beginning of the chapter, I said you'll never have to use the formal definitions again because there's actually three of them, but you'll need to recognize it. And this is like perfect example of college board saying, have our teachers at least taught that the derivative is a limit? You don't have to do it anymore. So when you look at this, you need to tell me that, okay, this is changing y, we're changing x, we're taking the limit, right? So this is the limit of the function f. So this is f's derivative, correct? At what point? Two. Exactly. This is f prime of two. That all I know is that f prime of 2 equals 0. There's some stuff I could deduce from that. Well, there must have been a horizontal tangent line at 2, correct? That type of stuff. But let's go see what they, they've got going for me. The limit of f of x as x approaches 2 does not exist. Getting 0 over 0 does not mean it doesn't exist. It means you need more work, correct? f is not defined at 2. Not what that means. It must have been defined actually, because if it wasn't, I couldn't take a derivative there. It's just this. It's two. The derivative of f at two is zero. So two. Right? It doesn't have one. All right. Is there another one? Yeah. Okay. Then I have to scroll this way. I have to page ahead. So one more same sitch. I want you guys to try this. I have one of these on the test. I'm going to tell you. I actually might have two of these formal definitions, and I said you don't have to do it yet to recognize it. I'll tell you the most common wrong answers. So there's five answers up there. Two come up quite a bit as incorrect. So I'm going to let you guys decipher what this is the notation for. And then I'll tell you the two most circled wrong answers. And it shouldn't take you very long. You should look at that and go, any limit in this chapter is a derivative. Okay? This is the derivative of a function. And people might go, oh, this is a sine of pi. That's zero. No, it's not. The derivative of sine is not sine. Some people will say, oh, this function sine, this is its derivative. What's the derivative of sine? So why is b wrong? Yeah, this is at a specific, that would have been if there was an x here. Then my answer is B, okay, a function of X. But this is that function at a specific X value. So this is really cosine of what? Pi. Now we need to make sure that we know our unit circle and don't choose E, the third best wrong answer, right? What is it? C. All right, so that's it for warm-ups. Now we're going to move on and take some short notes. Um, actually, they're really just one page, so that's why I'm like, I can do this in a 45 minute period without stressing them out. So we're going to be on our notes, the last section. So next week, we do together on Monday sort of a comprehensive skill review, not like practice problems, just what you're expected to know. Um, and then Tuesday and Wednesday, you're going to work on a review packet. If you think you have a busy week next week, you can grab the review packet when you leave, too, if you want to study. Make sense? Yeah. I'm just going to tell you not to start on the first page, so you can do everything after that. All right, so we've got some derivatives, our last ones. So we've been learning rules. Some of the rules I told you why they work. Some I didn't because we just don't have enough math info to. These I can. Actually, you guys did some of these on the circuit without knowing you were proving a rule. So we know that the derivative of sine is cosine, cosine is negative sine, and we kind of have all of our derivatives when we look down the same cloud, negative thing, negative cloud, and it ends the way it begins. That's easy to remember. But we haven't talked about the other four trig functions, and they have good derivatives too. We haven't talked about tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. I'm going to draw a bar right here. 
you're going to have to memorize these two. But if you don't, you do have a backup plan, okay? Because they get derived with the quotient rule. Does that make sense? So actually, I want to derive the tangent one because I like that one better. So we're going to do the derivative of the tangent. We're not going to derive all four. You actually had this on your circuit today, I mean yesterday. And our task yesterday was to apply the quotient rule, and this wasn't the quotient. So how did you write it? You made it a quotient, I'm assuming, or you copied the key. But what did, what did you or I write it as? Yeah. And then we launched into the quotient rule, and that's the proof of why the derivative of tangent is secant squared. And I'll give you a little way, I like to give you ways to remember things you have to memorize. All right, so I will give you that in just a second. But this goes low, d high, the derivative of sine is cosine, minus high, and what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine, so that things will like make that a plus. If you didn't see what I did there, I just changed that. And then I draw a line, and I square below. Somebody who did their circuit at pencil phase, do you remember how this one all of a sudden became secant squared? Yeah, Nathan, do you remember? I just you put together the you multiply the cosine with the other cosine. Yeah, if you can't hear him on the video because he's farther in the back, you say multiply those cosines and sines together, and then what are you going to notice about what you wrote up on the numerator? That's a trig identity. Cosine squared plus sine squared is one, and one over cosine is secant. And by the way, if you always get those mixed up, it's again still in the same cloud. The s's and the c's go together. Okay, so one over cosine is secant. One over sine is cosecant. So this becomes secant squared x, which now becomes a rule because we use it so much. I don't want to go through this every single time. Agree? Agree. Now, if you had done the exact same thing for cotangent, you would have swapped these, correct? And actually, what would fall? If you want to do it, go ahead. But it ends up being exactly what you would think it is. If tangent's derivative is secant squared, my gut, gun to my head, I'd pick cosecant squared. But what's the only difference? There's a negative, and that's how all the cofunctions go. The derivative of sine is positive cosine, but the derivative of cosine is negative. So all the cofunctions' derivatives go negative. Makes it easy to remember. Um, I'm not going to prove this one for the sake of time. You did it on your circuit, and you're just going to trust me that that's what we would get. All right? But we would write secant as 1 over cosine, and then we'd run through our quotient rule on it, and when we're done, we would get secant tangent. Here's the way you're going to remember it. 1t, 2s's. Agree? This is the same for this one. There's 2s's and 1t. So you're going to go, oh, I need two s's and a t. So they both have what? Two s's and a t. So when I say, what's the derivative of tangent, you're going to go, I need the two s's. Secant squared. When I say, what's the derivative of secant, you're going to say, well, I need another secant and a t. All right, so two s's and one t. And the co-functions fall by default because it's what your gut would tell you. Like if I said, Caroline, I'm going to hit you over the head if you don't guess what secant tangent, but I'm sorry, what? Cosecant derivative. She goes, it's probably cosecant cotangent. And so go with your gut, but the cosine functions always go negative. So I proved one. Understand, I could have proved all. So now, to end our chapter, we're going to have all of our rules running together in the same problem, and you just have to keep them straight. So in this first one to find the derivative, I have two rules, three rules. I have the subtraction rule that says I can do the derivative separately and just subtract. Same rule for addition, correct? Then I have the power rule, technically, or that I know that the slope of the line y equals x is 1. So I have three rules in one problem. Now, just today, we said that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. You're going to have to memorize that, but I gave you a good way to do that, and we are done. Right? Now, I'm going to come back to that one in just a second. But before I do it, I'm going to go to letter B. This is testing rules within rules, right? This is what it's not. 
I don't just say the derivative of x is 1, the derivative of secant oh, 1 is another s, and the singular t. What's wrong with what I just did? I made my own rule up that I never told you. The, a product of two functions requires what rule? The product rule. You don't just hop in there. Uh, the first people done with the chapter two test make me nervous. They do. Like usually I get like the first two or something to bring it up to my desk, but they're really earlier than the rest of you. What generally is the case? Maybe the rule. Yeah, they made things way easier than they actually are. All right, so just be careful with that. Not to say that's always the case, but on this one, my dy dx is going to be equaling first d second. And what's the derivative of secant? Uh, Try tangent. not to look. Secant, secant tangent. tangent. Yeah, it needs two s's, both of them, and one t. So there's first d second plus second. And again, what's the derivative of the first? One. All right. So, oops. First d second. <laughs> plus second d first. I could factor a secant out, but I don't want to. So that's basically the notes, except I need to go, here's my turner. I do want to talk about the top of this. We're, we're, this is what we're cutting out, just so that we can at least start the homework today. Um, so it's helpful to know uh, the three Pythagorean identities. So let's go ahead and write them down. Cosine squared plus sine squared, we all know, has to equal what all the time? One. The other two, if we forgot them, it doesn't matter. Because they fall out from this naturally. So like in BC, I don't like you to flood your brains with a ton of memorization. If I can avoid it, I do. I would memorize this one, which is already in your brain, and then just let the other ones leave and bring them back when you need them. Does that make sense? For example, you know there's one that's about tangent squared, correct? I'm going to go create the tangent squared right here in red. And so I'm going to do that to all of these. And the next trig identity falls in my lap without me having to memorize it. It's 1 plus tangent squared equals what? Secant squared. It just, I didn't need to memorize it because it just kind of falls in my lap. Does that make sense? Yep. Similarly, if I want the other one, I know there's one with cotangent squared, but I can't remember if it's like cotangent squared plus cosecant squared equals 1, or cosecant squared plus 1 equals cotangent squared. I always get a mix up, but you shouldn't, because all you have to do is create your cotangent squared. Stop it. Alright, which gives me cotangent squared x plus 1 definitively. Now I didn't memorize it, I just said, oh, I know the one equals what? Cosecant squared x. So let's go back before I pass out your puzzle. Let's go back to that 1 over here. If it was multiple choice and you didn't see this answer, what might you have seen instead? If you know tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared, what would 1 minus secant squared safely be replaced with? Negative. Negative tangent squared, if it was there. All right? So if you're like, I know I did it right and I don't see it. Sometimes it's one of those identities. And then also make sure you know your reciprocal ones. I know you know 1 over tangent is cotangent. But make sure you also now have it that 1 over sine 100% all the time. Cosecant. Just think same S's and C's. They're helpful in this class. Cosecant X. Similarly, 1 over cosine then is. So I wouldn't say memorize them, know them. <laughs> right? So your assignment is, and if you're uh, absent and watching these at home, it's a puzzle, but you don't need to, the, the doing the puzzle part at the top is the least important thing, so you can just do it on the sheet of notepaper to show your work for the problems. These guys are going to do it right on the puzzle. We're going to do one together, not number one, one of the problems. When to do? Monday. Monday. Not tomorrow. I am not going to be here. Um, Carter, one, two, three, four, five. The first time the whole year. All right, let's see. Say congratulations, Mrs. Slavrud. Yeah, I have one extra. Four. See, it's, I do this every day, every hour. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just don't have the patience to do that five times a day, every day. You know what I mean? It's taxing on their soul. All right, let's go try number three, just for fun. Number three has three rules in it. First one. 
first and foremost, it is a product of two functions. So I'm testing the product here. Then you need to know the derivative of e to the x is what? E to the x. E to the x. And what's the derivative of secant? Without looking. Yeah, you don't get a note card ever in here. Or on the AP test. So you do two things like that to know. You got to know, or you got to know how to derive them. <coughs> Sorry, I had a problem. So we're going to go first p second plus second p first. And know that we might not see it in exactly that order because Mr. Lou jumbled them up. So first would be e to the x. What's e second? Secant x tangent x. The Hindu circle letter O has made up their own rule and done them separately and just multiply them. But we know we do first be second plus second what? E first. And what's the derivative of E to the X? Alright. Do you see your answer explicitly stated? Yes. Yeah. Not explicitly. Well, it's there. Well, Which one is it? U. U. So it's got factors. So sometimes you need to do a little more work with it, but Letter U would give me the correct answer. All right, so that means that in the free slot, where is the free slot? Right next to the 2 and the 11 on the right-hand right side. Right next to the 2 and the 11 on the right-hand side. There it is. He is correct. Uh, mm. We'll put a little U in there, and we're going to answer. What will it unveil? A famous quote yeah. made by one of the founders oh, of Tell Phillips which would be either Sir Isaac Newton or Herr Gottfried Leibniz. So we just switch it up because then it would be a little bit more than that. Probably it's only a portion of a quote. So you'll have to if you want to see that. You might have to consult the reply as well. Have at it. You have how many minutes? My schedule is... Oh, really? Oh, I have to stop recording. Gosh. Poor kids are going to think the video was super long, and I actually... It was actually quite...